Hello, everyone. We are live. Welcome to the Audiofall Roundtable. We've got our Friday edition. Thank you so much. If you haven't already, subscribe to our YouTube channels. We've got Norman Mazzy Maslov. We've got Tim from University of Vinyl. And we've got a special guest I'll introduce right away. I'm here, of course, as you guys know, at the Hi-Fi Center, downtown Vancouver, for all your Hi-Fi gear. Anyways, let's get to our panel. This is going to be a fun one today. There they are. Whoa. Good looking, good looking panel. Hi, guys. How are you? Yeah. I've got to introduce. I got to introduce. I introduce you too. But we've got Jeff Edgers from the Washington Post. How are you? I'm good. I'm a little shadowy, but it's gonna gonna have to do. But I'm good. Thanks for thanks for having me on. Yeah, no, I know you and I chat a lot, so I was excited. I know you went away to Europe for the last month, so we couldn't have you on. So as soon as I knew you came back, I was like, oh. I wonder what records he got. So hopefully he has some stuff to show us today. So if viewers don't know Jeff Edgers, uh, he's been around the Washington Post for many years, been around doing music for how long has your journalism career been in the music business now, Jeff? Well, so I'm not even a music writer, so I yeah. don't know that much, but I'm, I'm the national arts reporter at the Washington Post since 2014. And I was at the Boston Globe before then. Uh, so, but I've been writing like professionally since I was, uh, 1993 when I got out of, got out of school, but I'm a reporter, so I, I never review stuff. Okay. I never pretend I know things I don't know, but I love music and I've written a lot on, uh, uh music and artists and profiles and things like that. So you shouldn't be a YouTuber then if you, uh, are going to pretend to know stuff you don't know, because that's what we do. <laughs> yes, exactly. I don't think I am a YouTuber. <laughs> I think I'm a guest on your, on, on, on your show. You said it was a show, right? It's a show. This is a show. Yeah. You've been on the show yeah. before. This is not, no, I know. this is not your first rodeo. I'll tell you that. So, yeah. Um, I will want to say, I mean, we'll start with Jeff. I know you did a lovely piece. I mean, a week ago or so, um, the lovely Sinead O'Connor passed away. Here's Jeff Edger's piece in the Washington Post. If you haven't written or you haven't read it already, please uh, have a read. It was very well written. Uh, you know, and I think I'd like to hear more from your point of view. because Obviously, you spent time with Sinead O'Connor and it does say that in that piece. I'd like love for you to sort of um, add on to that piece and tell the viewers your thoughts on, on that article and your thoughts on Sinead. Well, uh, the piece, I did a big profile on her in 2020, um, and uh, I went and followed her down the West Coast, and she was doing this like little kind of small tour to, to dip her toe in the water again and see if she was going to play a larger tour. And uh, we drove in a van or in a rented car for like uh, eight hours because she didn't want to check in on the plane because I think she, she liked to smoke, so she wanted to smoke. <laughs> and uh, we'd rented a car. So I drove her there for like eight hours. And then I saw like three of those shows. They were unbelievable. Yeah. I wasn't like the huge Sinead O'Connor fan in the day because it just like I liked her, but I wasn't a huge fan. But what was startling to me is how great her music was, even, you know, up to her last record and how incredible those sh songs were in person. And I, I just hadn't been listening like a lot of people because you know, she just was selling fewer and fewer. So I did that. And then also I went to Ireland because she, she said I could come and I spent a few days with her there. And we talked about everything. I mean, we talked about um, her past and the Pope picture and her mother had been very abusive and she was having a lot of problems with her, one of her four children who was having some issues with his mental <clears throat> health. And that was very pressing. She was working on her memoir. Um, and, you know, these were not always easy conversations. There were things she would sometimes bring up that were triggering to her. There's something, things I would bring up that were triggering to her. We'd have to walk them back or just calm down or whatever. And, um, but uh, she was uh, really a special person. And when I was there, I noticed in her house, she had no records or no Grammy awards or whatever. And she said she didn't know where her records were. So I went, they had like a Tower Records in, in Dublin it was like a fake Tower Records, like it looked like Tower Records, and it was called Tower <laughs> Records, but as we know, that doesn't exist. But she loved um, Bob Dylan, and in particular, uh, she loved Gotta Serve Somebody. So I bought that record, and I brought it to her and gave it to her. And so like a year later, she was doing a Washington Post Live, which is similar to a YouTube show, except it's on the Washington Post homepage. And she wanted to do one to promote her memoir, and I wanted to talk to her anytime I could. And she came on, she was like smoking a butt and like swearing a lot, wearing a Black Lives Matter t-shirt and very eloquent and profane and all that stuff. And at the end, she said, I I'd love some more records. How can I get them? And I'm like, I, I, I don't know. And she's like, just send them to Jeff. And so 
people just must, I guess my address is easy to find. So I started getting records like at home. Got like, <laughs> oh, well, some of them were like, I kind of called through them. I was like, I don't think she's really going to dig this. Like every breath you take the singles, the police. I, just, I, I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong, but like, you know, Jimmy Cliff and like, uh, you know, Carol King and like, uh, just great records. And I put them together and I sent them off to her. She gave me what she had moved and she had new address. I sent them not cheap. It's like probably spent maybe like 250 bucks on the package. We know about shipping. <laughs> to, to, and, to um, yeah. and I kept in touch with her over time, you know, but, um, you know, she had a tough life and uh her son who was who was having so much trouble he killed himself last year and it was just crushing to her because she really identified with him in, in many ways and um and i was in ohio when my editor called and was like did you hear about Sinead? and i didn't and i was just in a parking lot i read it. and at first i was like you know in the olden days people would write like someone would die and there'd be like one obituary and like maybe one analysis and today i'm not saying it's a bad thing but it's like everybody has a take like uh, and I've done it before, too. It's like Tom Petty dies. Why is American Girl one of the great power pop songs of the 70s? You know, like we all have a take. And for some reason, just because I really found her to be special and I that experience had been very intense, I just didn't want to do a take. So I didn't do anything for like a day. And then I just was coming home and I just thought I should write this up. The thing that that whole story hinges on, and I'm sorry I took so much time on it, but it's like it's Sinead O'Connor. The thing that it hinges on is like one night she wrote me while I was doing the reporting. She's like, I've got this song. I've got something. I wrote a song. Can I send it to you? Yeah. So she had written a song like on her front porch in Ireland about her son. And it, it's, un, it's a beautiful song. It's very much like structured like a classic kind of country George Jones-ish song. And, um, and she wrote me you know, about it. And then she didn't want me to tell anyone that it was about Shane, but she wanted to. And I said, can I share this in our story? And she's like, sure. So we had posted it in our story and I put it at the end of this piece too. It's beautiful and um, very raw. And like she said, she had a chest cold, but I don't know. Um, and that whether you read any of my words or not, I don't really care. But if you like listen to that song, it's pretty, it's pretty moving. So there you go. That's my whole Sinead O'Connor. Her Cox. voice never went away. She had the strongest voice, at least what I heard to the end. And I did watch a lot of the coverage of the funeral, which was amazing how how many people came out in mm-hmm. Ireland. You know, it, it, I've been to that tower actually in Dublin before, and I've been to Ireland and Glendalough and Dublin area. And it, they really hold their musicians uh close to the vest, you know, whether it's Van Morrison or, and, and we think about how outspoken their musicians are, Bono, Sinead O'Connor, you know, uh, Van Morrison in a different way, obviously. Uh, and uh, Dolores from, uh, you know, uh, the Van Morrison, Morrison, yeah. Yeah, who died a couple years ago. So um, thanks for writing that. I read that a great thing. I, mean, I love Sinead O'Connor. I was at the Dylan show at Madison Square where she came out and people booed her. I was so fucking pissed at that. And then, um, of course, Chris Christopherson walks out and um, just, I mean, she, it's, she ended up being right about that whole Pope thing at the time. And I saw an interview later where she talks about someone like maybe 10 years ago asking her about the Pope. She goes, I have no problem with this Pope. You know, and things are different now. And it's um, and the whole thing is about the abuse in the Catholic Church, maybe wrong venue, whatever you could, you know. But I was more pissed off that um, like the, the reactions from like Sinatra, if she were in abroad, I'd like punch her in the face or I'm paraphrasing there, but something like that. So, <laughs> Jeff, your favorite Sinead O'Connor album, I know Duke or Bud 88 says Universal Mother, best album. What, what do you feel her best album was? You know, it's hard for me to say because I like if I listen to the one with the last day, the famous one, uh, <clears> Last <throat> Day of Our Acquaintance and <clears throat> and um, uh, the second album. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, why am I blanking on the name of the, the, so- the song about uh, the brutality against uh, people of color? What's that called? Oh, um, Black, Black, Black Boys on yeah. 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 I don't know why I blank on that. But I mean, that's pretty amazing. But then like you listen to like. Uh, fourth and fourth and vine which is Mm. off a record she put out in 2012 and like what a great song like it's just i don't understand why people weren't listening at that point you know 
I haven't really heard that much of a reggae album, but people tell me that's a pretty well, good Fire album. Fire on Babylon is a pretty great track, and that that album is really good. And, you know, the Irish, and I, I'm not going to even try to pronounce it because it's like Gaelic, you know, but that one she did where she's leaning over into the camera with a beautiful color behind her, uh, it's a very folky, uh, traditional type of uh, Irish album. Yeah, I know what you mean, yeah. It's so beautiful. Yeah, I just I'm, I wish I would come out on vinyl. I have a CD of it. I mean, the thing that was so sad, I mean, everything was sad, sad about this, but like she was touring and it was like a religious experience. I mean, I saw that show at the El Rey in Los, Los Angeles was like one of the three shows I saw. I think that has like a 750 person capacity. So nothing amazing show. And when she plays all those songs from over the years, she had a really supportive band. You go, Oh, it's not just, you know, it's not just nothing compares to you. It's, there's so much more here. And she was just about, I mean, we we're texting. She was calling because she was like, she got to Chicago to open up the next leg of that tour that was coming to Boston, to New York. And then she got there and her bass player didn't come because of COVID and then COVID shut everything down. And so she just never made that tour, you know? Here's a question. I mean, Sinead O'Connor, obviously the big Pope thing back Saturday Night Live, ripping the Pope's picture. We talked about that. But I mean, social media wasn't around back then. I feel today, if that would have happened in today's times, I think she would have been more embraced because of social media. And I don't, I don't, I think her career would have taken a different trajectory if that was the case. Any, any, anyone want to jump in on that? I mean, hindsight. I don't know. <laughs> it would have been so divided like it is now. Like, it's look at all this, like, you know, a trans person, you know, does a beer commercial and people like heads explode or something, you know? Yeah. Yeah. But the two people from the nineties, I mean, I know this is going to be an odd comparison, but I am not the first person who made it. I was, uh, somebody else suggested to me, but I think it's good. It's like Monica Lewinsky and Sinead were like savaged in the nineties. I know. And you can make a pretty good argument that they were both victims of, you know, mistreatment and, you know, misogyny or whatever you want to call it. It was just Mm -hmm. like, they were, terribly savaged and um unfairly and i don't know would that happen today i'm not sure i mean there's a really powerful powerful um you know sense now that there's like a a social justice that and and a fight for social justice that you didn't have at that moment in time and sexism you know and and people who are like 30 years old now they're strong they they don't care about the power structure and they say what they mean and so i don't know if these crotchety old people like Cardinal Bernard Law, you know, the in Boston, just before, you know, obviously he's going to be taken down with the church crisis, is attacking Sinead O'Connor in in newspaper articles, or Joe Pesci, as you referenced, you know, going on Saturday Night Live and and making a joke about, you know, her bald head, or Frank Sinatra. I don't know if those people would have gotten away with that today. There's no way. Yeah. And that's why I think the power of social media, the power of all this, I think was could you know could have been a bigger thing if it was a ba- around back then too. It would have helped. So I mean, hindsight is what it is. And I think Sinead, you know, obviously, like you said, Monica Lewinsky. Wow, um, they went through a lot. Unfortunately, really did for no reason. It's deep stuff, Jeff. I don't know. We should probably move on. We could talk about Sinead all day. Cobra is one of the great like post punk albums, though. That's like, such a great record. So. Great record, great record. All right, let's talk about what you want to talk about, though, too. Well, yeah. okay, okay. I know there's some I'm <laughs> getting comments on, but thanks for that. Um, if anyone hasn't read the article, I'll just put it back up. Uh, Sinead O'Connor is still in one piece. Is the article written, what was that, March of 2020 by Jeff Edgers, Washington Post. Check that one out. Great article. I really enjoyed it. Actually read it twice. So thank you for that, Jeff. A um, couple of things we want to talk about. This is the audio file roundtable. Um, I know some are going to be sick of it, but I'm not sick of talking about Steely Dan's a- a- UHQR AP's De- uh, Pretzel Logic album. Lots of controversy around it. I've said mine. I want to start with Tim. Tim, thoughts? Um, I've got an original... ABC Black Label pressing, and frankly, I I um I just wanted to wait and read some reviews, see some opinions, and I've decided I'm not gonna I'm not gonna buy the uh, UHQR. Um, I was really impressed with Nathan's take on it, and I kind of trust Nathan's view. Um, I think you kind of covered that Wednesday, and he put a long post, couple posts on the Facebook page. And I've seen some other videos from other folks in the vinyl community, and uh, they're all kind of trending the same direction. And um, I'm really happy. I've got a near mint copy. I've got a Santa Maria pressing, which is a nice, clean pressing. And that's that's me. 
I'm waiting for Gaucho and uh, Asia for sure. And, and Asia, Mr. Katie lied. I'm, I'm very curious to see what they can do with that. And Asia, as we know, is now going to be pushed to October 29th uh, release date through Analog Productions. Uh, I didn't buy it, but a viewer, or actually I should say someone on the Hoffman Forum reached out to me and said, hey, Mazzy, do you want to hear this thing? And he, this guy lives in the Bay Area. His name is Tim. That's all I'll say. He sent me his copy. I got it. Uh, oh, yes, my God. Copy. Without the box? He even said, I can't send you the box, Mazzy. Those of you in the know will know what that's about. <laughs> but uh, 45 RPM, my friend Kimbo was here. We listened to three tracks together or two tracks together. And then I listened to I've listened to each three times. First of all, my 49 years I've owned this copy. I got this the month it came out in February 74. I'm older than you guys. And, it, and I cleaned it and it still sounds great. No static. It sounds amazing. It's a rock and roll record. This basically neutered the record. It's actually for this clarity quiet vinyl that all those labels are promoting. It's not that quiet. And I just found out the guy that sent it to me did ultrasonic before. So it's still not perfectly quiet. Um, it's just, it's neutered. That's all I'll say. After hearing this, we kind of basically said, excuse the expression, what the fuck did they do? That, and uh, that's all I'm going to say about it. It's not worth getting uh, for my take. Uh, the acoustic guitars and every major dude are the best part of the uh, UHQR. That's kind of mm -hmm. nice. That's hopeful. But then Love it goes song. downhill from there. It's like like the vocals are way up. No highs. No The mid-range <clears throat> kind of uh, funky. It, it's just, <clears throat> the first one's great. The original's great. So and that's all I'll say about it. I got a chance. Jamie Howard from Plagium Process has sent me a uh, Plagium Process. Ricky, don't lose that number. Um, Plagium Process, and it sounds quite quite interesting. You know, obviously reducing the bias and the wow and flutter. I, I really enjoyed that one. It sounded great. But I did a quick video the other day on. I have the Santa Maria pressing, like Tim, and I think yours is the same, Mazzy. And I compared it to my UMG, and you know, the, the original came out on top. The UMG. <laughs> The UMG still uh, vocals were didn't you know didn't sound as as uh, you know, to some people as it's good. not their favorite, but uh, uh, people don't maybe remember. Of course, they're a long time ago. Ricky, uh, Ricky is their biggest selling single. It's it their is. most popular single, and of course they rip off the or they they borrow from the uh, Horace Silver uh, song from my father intro. Dun 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 is Horace Silver. So there we go. Enough of Steely, though, right? Well, <laughs> there you go. So, um, I mean, we got to talk Rhino. Who wants to talk Rhino? Look at this. Look what came out today. I know Mazzy wants to talk about it. Mazzy, let's talk about this one well, first. I, you know, I don't know much about that album. And uh, I do know that if you don't know Jaco Pastorius, he... Um, his big claim to fame was he was he was not the original, but in the what third, fourth album, I don't remember. Someone's going to correct me. Uh, became a member of Weather Report. Fantastic bass player. Had drug abuse problems uh, later on. Unfortunately, died way too young. Incredible documentary you got to see on Jocko. He was on what three maybe Joni Mitchell records. Fantastic sounding player. His best album is the black and white cover album solo album on Columbia. And I don't know that record very well. Surprising choice to me. But uh, if anyone else can talk about that record, uh, that would, do you know that record, Tim or or Jeff? Uh, I've got I've got a one weather report record that he's on and uh, a couple of the um, the uh, other other albums. But I think the most the, the, the more controversy, maybe it's controversy is this. And let me preface. This is um, Van Morrison, Banner Street Choir, 1970. I have an original green label, which is amazing. And this is also a Kevin Gray cut, several of these. Now, people are saying that's the wrong one to do. They should have done St. Dominic's and all this stuff. Here's the deal that is complicated. Warner Brothers, we uh, Warner's now, does not have the rights to all these albums. And it's really weird which one. It's like a puzzle, which one Warner's has rights to. The other, I believe, are part of Polygram and went over to... Um, Universal Music. So uh, Moondance, now I can't remember. Moondance, Warner Brothers does have rights to. St. Dominic's, they don't have rights to. Uh, Tupelo Honey, they don't have rights to. But so it's not in all in the, I think it's the first two they have rights to. Astral Weeks, 
I'm, I think they do Astro Weeks, Moon Dance, and this might be the only ones. Everything else is now part of Universal. So Warner Brothers cannot do it. So it is an interesting choice. This is a fantastic record, and I like it. Had a hit single in Domino, and Virgo Clowns is great. So it's an interesting choice. It's a surprising choice, but that's the reason why they couldn't do those other uh, Van Morrison records. But it is surprising since they've done so many uh, Kevin Gla Gray releases already of this. So did it just kind of drop on their website and maybe an email today? Because I, I was it was kind of like out of the blue. I thought here here's the website. Here's what it looks like on the website right now. So yeah. Um, yeah. I did not get an email, so I don't know. I mean, I got I got an email, but I'm I'm, I'm on there. I would be on their press list, so they. I got an email telling me those were coming, you know. So let me ask you, so out of us, you know, are anyone going to order or pre-order the high, his band in the street choir or this one here? <laughs> Why was the uh, Van Morrison $60? Is it a double LP? Is oh, you know what? I think that's a Canadian. I got, I went on the Canadian site this okay. morning. So it's 60 <laughs> Canadian. Sorry. I didn't realize. So let's I mean, it's, it's just an Canadians. interesting, you know, it's funny because I don't know if any of you guys listened to, I know you, you did Steve, but I mean like the pretzel logic, I have the original, but you know, I'm more apt to try, you know, Oh, this, I'd be curious about this new cut, the Bernie Grunman one. That's like digitally, you know, with the digital step in it. I just, you know, to, to throw down a hundred, what, how much is the UHQR? It's 150. I, would I mean, I bought, I bought, a, I bought, um, the UHQRs I bought were the, uh, I got the Bob Marley ones. Cause I felt like those were like kind of hard to track down, but like, you know, I love experimenting with listening to the different, different ones, but, um, I'm probably not going to throw down $150 to experiment with one of the Steely Dan's when, I know how good they sound when you get the right one. And um, they're not like secret hard records to, to find. I mean, like I found like this record, this right here's a good example of like reissues that can, can I ask, tell you this or no? Oh yeah. I like this record, this uh, Willie Nelson record. Teatro. Oh, I love this record. It's like one of, I remember getting the CD when it came out as like that Daniel Lenoir record from, but he didn't like, to Len Wyatt, if that makes sense. <laughs> Amy Lou Harris is all over it. It's a um, great record. Came out in 97. I guess there's been like a couple vinyl releases over the years, but they just put that out. And I'm like, that's a great record to like put out. Like, well, have you, have you heard I just, that just showed up on my door yesterday. I, yeah, I put it on as soon as it came. I don't, I don't really have, okay, cool. like, I have a stack like everybody else were like, oh, I don't have time for this. But like, as soon as that came, I broke it out and put it on. It's such an awesome album. Now, that's a different category than all these others. It's like, I'm not yeah. taking seven copies out and going like, oh, wait, they kind of, boosted the base on this one it's like it just <laughs> right. exists as an amazing musical experience and i'm just so happy that i can enjoy it but you know i don't know how much sometimes i look up records like that when they only put them out like in very small pressings back in 1994 or something and well, they're like you know a thousand dollars or something so that came right. out on record store day about six seven years ago that's when i got it but it was. I don't, I don't know if it sounded good. I mean, like, it I, sounds I don't great. Know. It sounds but you can't get. I don't think you can get the record store day one now for a regular right. price, yeah. right? So it's good. That's a perfect example of something they should put out. And what was it? A thirty-five, forty dollar record? Thirty dollars? Something like that. It's not. It, I right. think it might not even be that expensive. I, it's I like, think it was twenty-five bucks. I, and it's I, a nice heavy cover, isn't it? Yeah, right. I mean, the Steely Dan was how much was that? Twenty. Not, I don't, 25. Twenty-five. Yeah, twenty. Bucks. I mean, these are not. These are not getting into. Uh, you know, these yes. are not expensive. Put up the Willie Nelson for people to see again. I will just I'll put you on full screen so they can see it. Yeah, I mean, like you know, this record is fantastic. It has all the, it just sounds great. It's love that's it. the love theater that uh, he uh, Daniel and Wall uses sometimes to record. I don't know if he owns it, but he records in that theater these uh, these rec records. Uh, this yeah. another. I mean, I'll just show you one other one in that category for me. I feel like this is kind of a hard record to get, like original pressings for like a reasonable price. So how is that? Like, Sounds good to me. I mean, I don't really, what I don't like to do, and I don't love it when I read it too. It's like, I'd hate to be an authority on the sound of that record because to be an authority on the sound of that record, you better have like five or six different pressings over the years. And I don't, you know, I'm always surprised. I, uh, you mentioned it. I mean, I went to England for a little while and like I bought a 
way more stuff than I should have. And like, I was carrying it on the carry on with like 40 records, but like I got home and there were a couple that I listened to and I was like, wow, that sucks. I paid like <laughs> some decent money. Like I found like a David Bowie original pressing UK of low. I think I'm not, I don't think it was heroes low. I didn't pay that much for it. Maybe $35. And I put it on. I was so excited to hear it and I put it on and it was so deadly dull compared to and felt muddy compared to the um the one that i thought it would kill which was the one that was in the rhino box from a few years ago mm. it just didn't mm. sound that great so i'm sure there's another bowie low that sounds better in another time period but i wouldn't say oh the number one one to get is the rhino one because i just don't have the authority to say that but what i can say is that i really can't poke around and try to, you know, I'm interested in this because this is the group that did kind of blue and, you know, I'm interested in it. I love Cannonball Adderley. And so it's a perfect new, new record to put out to me. That should lead into, cause that's uh, what the year after he did something else, that same group or close to that group and something else is coming out on, on, um, was it a MoFi? It's a MoFi, uh, MoFi one step. That is yeah. my all time favorite jazz album. Something else. Cannonball Adderley with miles great record i'm i'm brought i'm not going to get it because i have what a music matters jazz and it came out as a classic i think in the last couple of years uh it took such a great record mine's an early 70s copy that i think sounds great yeah are you much into jazz tim like you still you have a lot of big jazz collection I, I started, you know, picking up the Tone Poets and the classic series and I'll buy, you know, random ones. I'll I'll shoot a text to uh, Rob the Wax and say, hey, is this a good title? It's, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, stuff like that. Um, I, I've got I've got 10 tone poets that are that are not even open yet. I mean, it's just um, I'm definitely slowing down on jazz, but no, I like jazz. I'm getting I'm growing into it. Um, it's not my first poll. Yeah, I should say I should say getting back to Rhino, I spoke with Patrick Milligan this morning, the A&R um, for Rhino. And I know there was a lot of uh, issues with the shipping and packaging of the first batch of Rhino records. And he did tell me that they fixed that problem and the records will be packaged and protected properly or better than the first batch. So I just wanted everyone to know that. Are these shipping immediately? Do you know? Well, I, I have no idea about that. I mean, if you look on the website, it says pre-order that one that I pulled up. I don't I know. Remember he, I think on your stream, he said we're trying to announce them closer to release date. So I'm just curious. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I would assume it's probably going to come out pretty soon. I mean, if it's a pre-order, right? I mean, if you remember the cars, I think that was pretty quick right after it, it was posted on the website. Right. Yep. Be curious, I'll be curious to hear some of the uh, reviews of, of, of these albums going forward. And I know they're, you know, they've already cut the, uh, the next batch as well. So it's going to be interesting times for Rhino going forward. But let's hopefully the shipping thing gets uh, solved. I think that's a big thing that uh, Rhino needs to figure out, which they, tell, they told me they have. So cross your fingers. You that's, know, what, we, that, that's what the press release says, by the way. It says, like, um, it says uh, that they're, both are available today exclusively at rhino.com. Uh, order now, you know, so it makes it sound like it's like okay. normally when I get press releases, it'll say like coming out September 19th or whatever. So, you know, one thing I will say about this where people should why people should buy it, because it includes the only photograph ever in the history of photographs of Van Morrison where he's smiling. So uh, <laughs> the, the grumpiest man in showbiz, yeah. definitely. Do we have any Robbie Robertson stories? I mean, um, he passed away on Wednesday. I'd love to hear some uh, stories or some comments about Robbie. Canadian boy. I made a whole um, video, which I won't get into. I was at the last waltz. I saw the band um, backing Dylan in 74. And I saw the band in 76 alone. Big fan of the band. Um, uh, and I have what? Five of uh, four or five of Robbie's solo CDs. I mean, to me, that's a tragic loss. I, I don't think any of us knew he was uh, sick, um, but what a great songwriter! Despite all the stuff you hear about publishing and and you know songwriting credits, and he was a great songwriter. And I hate to say it, whoever has their name on the credits is the one who gets the publishing, and that's been that screwed up so many bands over the years. And I and that, what I said in that video is that's why it's amazing. Groups like I think it's the Doors and REM are two bands. I don't know others that. Every member gets a credit of every song. 
And that's rare that someone mm -hmm. allows that of a songwriter. But, you know, it's fine when you're young, but when you're 40, 50, 60, and you're publishing royalties are coming in and you're not getting it, you know, there's turmoil in the old uh, family thing. Yeah, I always liked him. I mean, Robbie Robertson is a musician and a writer is kind of a special figure and a guitar player. I mean, his guitar playing is pretty awesome. I always, I, I didn't write something about him again, you know, a lot of people die. So, I mean, it's terrible. It feels like every day somebody important is, is going. Um, I, I always found him to be funny as a, a person, though. Like, I, I just remember when all that leave on stuff where he it just seemed pretty clear that like the rest of the band didn't really know that they were like breaking up forever. And uh, <laughs> and uh, when you watch when you watch the last waltz and you know that. It, it changes it because like they're telling funny stories, whatever. And he's like, the road, it'll kill you. You know, like he has all these. And right. I always remember, I remember as a kid when he went on Saturday Live with you too, and he did somewhere down the crazy river. It's just like he had, he was a little bit of a pompous man. Like he was absolutely, he was very sure of Robbie Robertson being an important figure to Robbie Robertson and the world. Um, and so, you know, it, it, it was always, interesting to see how how he he would you know how he dealt with that legacy because the band ultimately like you said they should have they were a band that was the point and they weren't one figure i mean take richard Manuel's voice out of that group and you lose something essential take garth hudson's crazy amazing ability to play five thousand instruments you know and levon and dank it's just they were a band that was what made them what they were not just one guy He's definitely had a, such an ego that he pushed it and he pushed his the story of the band in his direction and hooking up with Martin Scorsese. Yeah, ab absolutely right. And I, it's too bad someone didn't get up um, at the time and say, hey, we wrote those songs and whatever. Who knows what the true story was? I know LaVon Helm, uh, I read that book way back and uh, wasn't happy, rightly so. But the, one of the greatest voices of in that kind of music, as far as I'm concerned, too. I mean, isn't it funny well, that Lee, Robertson Lee Bond, was such a good friend of uh, of uh, Scorsese? You you could tell he got preferential treatment on the last. You know, there's these lingering shots of Robbie. Yeah. You know, the, the shirt open, and <laughs> it's uh, funny that but, out of all those guys, Levon became the bigger success as an actor. I mean, if you ever slept through yeah. Carney and watched oh, that, terrible. Uh, but uh, yeah, I'm sorry, uh, Tim. I didn't mean to cut you off. No, 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 no. But I, absolute legend. I love, I love the band. Um, I liked Robbie's first two solo albums. I thought those are great. Um, yeah, it just. But like Mazzy said, that was like kind of threw me for a curve. Was like, man, I, you know, he's. I think I had just read an interview. I saw Fran Lebowitz here in Boulder the other night, and she was talking about you know she's got a long relationship with Marty Scorsese and. Anyway, I started digging in that and reading, and, and they were talking about the new movie coming out this fall, and Robertson did the soundtrack, and apparently he just did an interview two weeks about it and you know, said he's very busy, blah, 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 and drops dead. <laughs> I wonder if he finished his soundtrack with Scorsese. I wonder where they were in, in, that, in that whole it's production. It's done, yeah. It's, it's it done? The, I don't yeah. know if he's the actual composer. I think he's more of you know, the musical uh, coordinator, bringing in music, yeah. and that whole thing, rather than a composer. I don't know though. We'll see. Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, it's you're right though, Jeff. Seems like every day these uh, people are, you know, passing away. But I mean, as we get older, everyone's getting older. It happens, right? It's just it's just it's been it's been a you know, quite a interesting couple of weeks with some of these uh, artists. But yeah, um, any other records, guys, that you want to talk about? You got you must have stuff. I can I can talk about the new. Uh, I you know, Mazzy did a video on it. The new latest neil young box there you go i was waiting uh, i was waiting for that we were we were texting back and forth so this is yeah. tim you go ahead i want you to put i'll put you on full screen go for okay. it okay well this is the latest it's the original release series i guess number five and we're picking up you know in 1989 with uh with freedom <laughs> and uh we've got ragged glory we've got weld which is uh i think a three lp set in arc I have only listened to uh, Ragged Glory, and I have an original pressing. Um, it's night and day so much better than the 1990 release. 
Um, and apparently they went back to the original master tape um, and cleaned that up a little bit. But just, it's got a huge soundstage. It's been expanded. You know, there's like, I don't know how many minutes of music were on the original Ragged Close Glory. Close to an hour. <laughs> Close to an hour on one On LP. one record, originally. And um, it was just... There's there's my original yeah, now there. It's a double album, and that's a triple. Now put it's that, uh, put that yeah. back up. Now it's a double album, um, and that's a triple. Yeah, yeah. There's four songs uh, that are uh, what well, one had never been released, I guess, uh, but they've been added on, you know, from the from the sessions during the time period. Um, and I have an original pressing of Freedom. And I thought that sounded pretty good. Now, I have not, I'm behind on listening to stuff. So I, I'm curious to see how Freedom uh, sounds, but that's been expanded onto two LPs as well. So yeah. that's, that's, but, you know, one Neil that Young. An hour that stuff. was expanded. Yeah. Yep. Hey, Mazzy, your turn on Neil Young. Have well, you listened just, to it? I just echo it. Uh, Freedom, I have an original. It's an hour, almost an hour on one record, which is crazy. Um, but the new one's two records sounds fabulous. Um, I did not have Ragged Glory. I have it on CD, and uh, that's three records here. It sounds great. It's a it, you know, it's it's a loud album. This is his Neil Young's grunge period. This is when the whole Godfather of grunge thing started happening. And a few years later, he did that album with Pearl Jam. Uh, uh, Weld is live, crazy, wild, grungy, wa uh, live. And Ark is uh, not for everyone because it's basically f a, a record of feedback. Um, yeah. So it's like he did for the soundtrack in a way to uh, Dead Men, where it's just guitar and noise and stuff. But it's it great series, as Tim says. Yep, I've got a, I got an interesting story about Neil Young. I mean, I was born and raised in Winnipeg, and Neil Young was a you know wasn't born in Winnipeg, but lived in Winnipeg a long time. Went to high school near mine. I mean, he's obviously older than me. But when Bob Dylan used to with his first time he toured in Winnipeg, um, he actually banged on the door of a house in Winnipeg that happened to be Neil Young's uh, house he lived in. The people were like freaked out because Bob Dylan showed up in this cab just by himself because he wanted to see where Neil Young grew up in Winnipeg and just basically <laughs> banged on the door. And it was it made the news. It made the newspaper in Winnipeg that Bob Dylan literally got into it, into a, into a um, taxi from his hotel by himself. He, he knew the address, told the ta ta taxi driver to go there, and he went and banged on the door and he got a tour of, of Neil Young's house in Winnipeg. Wouldn't that be crazy, Bob? Bob Dylan showing up on, at your house just unannounced. I thought that was a cool story. <laughs> Can you imagine yeah. if you knocked on his door, Howie? Do you know the story of A.J. Weberman? He's the guy. Garbage the, guy. The whole term garbology started. He was mm. the guy back in the 60s, I guess, that went through Dylan's garbage. Famous stories. Oh, wow. and stuff. So Google A.J. Weberman, Bob Dylan. <laughs> <laughs> Oh wow! So Jeff, what other what other um, okay what other records? You're in Europe for a long time. What else did you bring? Well, I was uh, I, I didn't bring them all because it's like uh, it was a lot. But um, my wife was nice about it because we like spent about seventy percent of the time hiking, and then about twenty five percent of the time either finding where stores would be and then investigating them. I like old records, so like I was in uh, Cumbria, which is rural England, north western part of it. And um, really found some amazing places. I mean, there was like this one town, Barrow, which had a record a record store called TNT. And there was really nothing in Barrow. It was kind of like a drab city with a lot of industrial stuff. But the guys there, the two guys there were awesome. And they let me go into the back room and start looking. And what you find is the things that we find that are so common here, like, oh, here's tapestry or here's like after the gold rush. They don't have those American pressings there. But all the stuff that I'm drooling over, trying to grab and never can, unless I want to spend a lot of money, they had just so many of them. I mean, I've grabbed, you know, Elvis Costello is a great example to me of records that they sound so much better on those FB UK pressings in, for the most part. They just, I, you know, anyone, my little kid can hear, anyone can hear it. And I can just find, I gobbled up, you know, like, ten dollars twelve dollars a pop you know these like this kind of thing like this record is just so awesome right cat stevens and to find like the original you know island pink hold, thing you hold, hold, hold up i love i love the island hold up for the uh, viewers the label there turn it around yeah i mean like it's just such a 
a great oh, version yeah. of this record. That great? Right? That's so nice. And I found like there were a billion of them, you know, like I got as many as I could to like give, I got some to my friends, you know, Brian Eno. Uh, Any Nick Drake, Nick Drake. I didn't find, so I'll tell you what, I, I, I did not find Nick Drake, but. No, that's hard to do. I think. I bought for too much money on the internet. I bought the box set that Hannibal put out. And it was the funniest, weirdest thing or not, or the most normal thing, but the box comes, it's pristine. And it's a reissue of all the Nick Drake records. And yep. uh, three of them were perfect, right? And then I get to Pink Moon, and it's like somebody put like a iron on it or something. <laughs> it was oh like God. covered in splotches, and I put <laughs> it on the thing, and it went like... And I, re I ended yeah. up returning it to the guy. It was so weird to me that you would sell something of that nature. And the first listing that had been put up said it was in mint condition, whatever. So I, um, I, I do have a copy of Pink Moon, uh, uh, 1976 pressing, I think it wasn't as much obviously as one of the originals, but I love that record. So, you know, but I mean like this record spike, hold it up, nice hold, hold it up, hold it up. Yeah, there you go. I just love, I love spike. Um, and I, just uh, that, I love that record. too. What and year was that one, Jeff? That was an 80. That's from 89. Okay. Um, and then these two. So I also bought like, I found original presses of like uh, live at Leeds and also Tommy. So I got Ooh, those nice. Um, nice. again. And actually, I'll tell you that I found those in an amazing record store in Oslo. I was in Norway, too. In Oslo, I was just desperately trying to get over there without angering my whole family every day. But, you know, they had amazing, great condition, fantastic. And then I was like, how do I mail these home? I stuck a few into my son's suitcase. I was thinking about asking my, my whole family was there. I was thinking about asking my parents. But they were like, why is he going record store shopping? Can't he just go to Lowell? And uh, and but. Uh, I got so many in my carry-on bag, but then I found, you know, these are awesome to me. Like, so this is, this is a, uh, uh, British original press of face to face. I'm pie. And perfect condition. And it was 899 Krona, which is expensive, but not, I mean, do the math. It's not, not that much compared to what we pay for records. And then this one, this is a, a great condition, small faces, you know, this small faces record, which I love. Um, and I got this one in Norway as well. And it was, it was nothing I, I bought. I don't think I'm not like one of those Beatles people who are obsessed with the mono Beatles. I actually think some <laughs> mono Beatles are cool, but I, I, I generally am have that weakness for the British stereo ones. But, um, I did buy like in, in this tiny town, I bought a, an original pressing of, of uh of the first Beatles record, not please please me. What was the second one? Not with meet, the Beatles. It's not, meet, it's not meet the Beatles. With the with, Beatles. With the Beatles. I got with the Beatles because it was like fifty dollars. It was in perfect shape, and I was like, oh, this will be a good sound experiment. I'd like to take that home and listen to it against the mono one that came out in two thousand fourteen. But you know, I I just wish I got so many, and I got as much as I could cram in my bag, and it was actually very heavy to carry on, but. I still wish I had more. There's still some that I'm like, God, why didn't I get that? You got why the bug. Jeff. Why didn't get? Why did I get that Thin Lizzy record when I was right near Leeds? You know, and uh, what, I should have bought. I should have gotten three teaser in the Fire Cat. Why did about I get London? That? London Calling. Did you find London Calling. Uh, I didn't find London Calling. I did find a copy of um, uh, uh, um, Give Him Enough Rope, but it was a little scratchy. But I got all the Pogues records from the '80s. That was another That's good cool. one. You know, oops, what happened? Cool. Next time I go there, I'm going to pick up every full pink label island when it's the full pink of of traffic records of Nick Drake, all that. That's my uh, like the, the thing that I'm lacking. And I anything with a pink label in the UK of Ireland is those first three yeah. Fairport conventions are yeah. incredibly expensive. I'd love to find those. You Leaf know? and Liege. Uh, yep. Oh, God, that's a perfect uh, unhalf bricking man. Yeah. Or All Jethro Tull, you know. I mean, there's so much stuff, but you yeah. know, there's a reason that those. I'm sorry, my camera seems to have. It's what happens when you're in a cabin. Can you, you see me? Okay, lighting, still. Man. You got mood right? lighting. Yeah. You got a little darker, but you're, you're, you're there. Lit. You have no. As long as I'm still there. So I'm where where are you? You said you're a cabin. Whereabouts are you right now? I, I we have a place in like rural Maine, so I sometimes go there when I have summer and want to not be in. Uh, I live in the Boston area, so sometimes I yes. I go up there and. I've been toasting. Oh, that's gotten a little lighter. That's, a little that's better. 
I've been hosting the Post's Washington Post pod, daily podcast so from this wonderful school called the Kent Hill School. And uh, we just, you know, I have a nice record player. I have a, one of those old Fisher hmm. tube thingy dingies that I got restored. And I, I love being here without Wi-Fi because I can um, actually read a book. Imagine that. Read a book. God's <laughs> sake. Or write a book. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I'm not really I'm not no. sure I'm capable of such a thing but thank you Massey. so yeah i love I, I i recommend if you can figure out a way to go on record trips and just pack not many clothes and just have room in your bag it's what a glorious thing to find who else is in rural england looking for records i'm sure other people but i feel like it's at least in some ways it's a more fruitful place to look than say in london or new york or los angeles and that's what i was going to ask you when you're at these record stores there's a lot of people buying records did you see a lot of people did you talk to the record store owner like what's what's their take on things yeah we talk i mean i talked to everybody in there my wife goes in there and she's a good conversationalist with them as well you know most people buy new records that are shiny and are on the shelf in general i mean you know when i'm looking for like oh do you have dark side of the moon and then i'm looking for like harry moss's you know initials in the stupid dead wire it's like I'm not sure there are too many people you guys would, but I'm not sure there are too many people who are like knowledgeable of that or paying any attention to that, you know? And, um, you know, when the guy brings back an F beat record that was reissued in 84 and I go, Oh no, I kind of wanted the one from 79. I don't, he's probably like, well, why isn't this good enough? You know, but <laughs> if you're there, you're there, you want to do the best you can. Let's take some questions from the viewers now. I'd like to, I mean, we got Je Jeff Edgers here. We've got, of course, Mazzy and Tim from Eaters of Vinyl. Anything you guys want to ask my my great guests here today? Um, I'm sure they can answer it, but I mean, I'm going to start off. Mazzy, tell me, in terms of um, your favorite, uh, I guess, UK albums that you own, do you have any Van Morrison UK albums that you can compare? Like, no. what do you have? You know, think about it, really. Van Morrison's uh, records, uh, except for the early uh, Them records, I, yeah. um, he, were American, orig yeah. American origin. Warner Brothers, I mean, aside, after Moondance uh, and a Astro Weeks, he moved, he lived in my neighborhood. I mean, not my neighborhood. He lived in Marin County. He lived in San Anselmo and Fairfax. And when I worked for ABC that back in the late 70s, one of my accounts was Caledonia Music, a small record store that he Oh, built for his parents. He brought him from Ireland, and there's these two little Irish old people with a giant uh, Van Morrison poster there. So they're American records, so they wouldn't be. Um, I have like like uh, Dave showed. I have a bunch of the Pie uh, Kinks records. Those are great. They're not great recorded records, but those are the best ones you're gonna get. Those Pie records. I have Decca, some Decca Stones albums, obviously Beatles <laughs> for days. Um, but when, yeah, I, I like, I'd like to get more, like you said, Fairport convention, the UK ones I don't have. I'd love those folk. I like British folk of the late, uh, seventies, all those Joe Boyd produced records like, um, Brian maybe, mentioned John, John Martin's great yeah, as well. Pentangle yeah. that I love <laughs> British folk rock and that kind of, so John Renborn acoustic folk music. I like the, the folk, uh, like, you know, Greenwich village had the folk, what do you call it? The uh, new folk revolution, what it was called in the early sixties, but in the late sixties, uh, uh, Britain had the folk revival, which was amazing. So Shirley Collins records, all that kind of stuff. You know. Jeff, any vinyl related articles um, that you're going to be writing from Washington post, like sort of like you did the, the one you know, with the whole MoFi controversy. I've got something that I'm working on, but it's not uh, uh, controversial in any way, but uh, I am working on something. Uh, I can't say what it is because we don't ever talk about what our stories are before we before we write them. But um, it's actually a story that was kind of cool that came out of the sound project that I but I pulled it out because it was like its own narrative and it was interesting. And I didn't feel like it could be plugged in there properly because it, it, it could exist on its own. So I think probably like late September, early October, I'll I'll do that that story, you know, and I always wanted to I have so much audio from that all that reporting and I wanted to do some kind of podcasty thing, but um, it's very hard. Uh, the podcast market is terrible right now. It's like nobody is purchasing podcasts. So uh, we've kind of put that on the back burner until we can get things together. I mean, I don't want to do like a podcast um, that's not 
the best they could be with all that material. You know, all those subjects who were in the sound story and Neil Young and Chad and all those people, they're all talking and, and being interviewed. It's good stuff there that's in my Dropbox. And um, I just need to figure out how to, how, to, how to use it because there's a huge audience for it, I think. And, and I'm interested in it. And, that sounds um, interesting, yeah. Be yeah, fun. so I don't, I don't know, you know, I don't know when that's gonna, uh, when that's gonna come. My stories are very, you know, la- that week with Sinead, I did a profile of Tiffany Haddish and a profile of Jim Gaffigan, and then the Sinead story. So it just goes across, it really does go across the board, you know. But thank you for asking. So Jeff, Jason asks this: Has your collecting changed at all since you started covering vinyl, being on the vinyl community channels, and uh, talking to people like us? Yeah, I mean, I really. I really read um, a lot. I read as much as I can and I try to learn as much as I can from people because there are people who've been doing this a lot longer than I have. I am sometimes frustrated that there are so many opinions that I think are based on limited knowledge and limited exploration. And so many people seem to be kind of dug in about what they believe and they don't change their views unless they don't change their views. They don't, you know, there are people who are like originals are the only ones or reissues are the best or Kevin Gray's amazing or Ryan Smith is terrible or Ryan Smith is amazing or what's Chad doing today. You know, it's just like, or like, (laughs) God, nobody has saved records like Chad, you know? So it's like, they're, they're just people dug in. And I sort of, sometimes you sort of know what you're getting when you, when you go to read it. And so what I've tried to do personally is like poke around. And if I find a piece of knowledge that I think is interesting, like, you know, use it. Ultimately, what I've found is that the best thing. Uh Oh, that's what you get for not having Wi-Fi at the cottage, right? He's going off of data. It's exactly what happens. uh, Yeah. While he's uh, rebooting here, uh, people should watch the uh, Iron Mountain uh, tour. Michael Fremer posted. Yeah, I saw that. Uh, I didn't watch it all, but there was a little thing. I'll, I'll show these. They mentioned Jellyfish. At hold the on, table. hold on, hold on. Jellyfish. These have, have been reissued in 10 years on Omnivore. They're from 1992. These albums came out. Very pop, 10cc, Beach Boy-like. Uh, a lot of great records. Only two records they made. And people are thirsting for these records. So there was a little clue there that these might be coming out on vinyl uh, soon. And I mentioned these too that these are records that i hope to come out on vinyl so jellyfish maybe uh it's happening sooner than later maybe maybe i think we lost i think we lost jeff i don't know what happened to him there but uh oh well i mean it's what happens when you don't have you don't have a wi-fi connection i guess i don't know friday afternoon in maine damn damn i'm surprised <laughs> didn't have some scotch beside him or a glass of wine right. I'm actually shocked right now right well, so I don't slice know. of blueberry pie <laughs> yeah yeah well yeah i mean um so what are you guys spinning this weekend? You guys have any plans to spin or is it just all family? Okay, I'll go. I, um, I'm a big Lou Reed fan and, uh, this is a, I found this the other day. This is sealed. It's an original. Um, and you know, you talk about Lou Reed. Most people talk about transformer or New York, maybe the live album. This is a really good underrated record. A lot of these late 70s records are great with some kind of deep tracks on them. I mean, the title track, Coney Island Baby, is an amazing song. Um, So I'm going to give that a listen. I think I'm going to open it on a video and talk about it. And It looks flat, so you always have to worry about a 40-year-old sealed record. So anyway. Yeah, you got to do a, a big hype on it, you know. Opening. Yeah, I'm gonna do like like right. Grand opening. I am opening a 42 year old record. That's I the like wax. The wax does that. He does those. Those are fun. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, J- Jeff, you're back. You look like you're on a TikTok uh, video was, right now. That was quite a um. That was quite a uh, uh like a the, the end of a series, right? Like when when Fonzie jumps up to the shark and then they close the episode because didn't I say? Yeah, like the last Sopranos. Things I learned, right? It's the can last I, Sopranos episode. Don't stop. I, ha- I have that. If you guys want to see, we can end the show right away with Fonzie jumping the shark. I have that video. <laughs> I'm sure you do. <laughs> I don't think we need that. No, I don't want to know. Jump the shark. Most What's dramatic, that? Do you want to hear the most dramatic thing that I learned? Yeah. 
Can, can you hear me, or is, it, or is, it, is this killing your stream? Uh -oh. Jeff we're, goes mobile. We, we've got, we get to see your cabin. We get to see your car. This is incredible. Like, what, what a tour. Can you, uh, can you hear me now or no? Yeah, yeah we can hear you. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. 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 So um, should I tell you the most, wasn't I saying like the most important thing and then I got cut off? Yes. Yeah. So should I tell you the most important thing? Yes. 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 Oh, right. <laughs> Fucking yes. All right. So you want to know it. All right. So the most important thing, it's not <laughs> even that important or shocking, but the most important thing, it's really simple. It's like almost everything that I'm told or, or learn or read I just uh, have to listen to. So like I have most of my records now, I have like two records, one after another. So I'll have like, you mentioned the John Martin record. It's like, I got a UK John Martin, right? So I've got the UK John Martin and the other John Martin back to back next to my record player. And when I get the time and, and no one's around so I can turn it up, I'll listen to those two and see what happens because ultimately there are no real rules. It's like that Bowie thing. I bought that David Bowie record thinking I could just take my newer edition and hand it off to some young street urchin. And it turns out <laughs> the new one is the better one. And if I hadn't listened, I may have made a terrible, terrible, fatal mistake, right? Your ears, your rig, yeah. your mind, your taste. That's just have an open, open mind and open ears and uh, who knows where it'll go. Yeah. <laughs> well let's leave let's leave it at that on a high note anyways guys uh thank you jeff edgers washington post mazzy thank you tim from university of vinyl it's friday we were just saying jeff you don't have a like a glass of scotch or anything in front of you right now at the, you're at the cottage listen you should be listening to some you know cannonball adderley or whatnot you're not doing any of that I, what's gonna upset you more than that is after we get off i need to go onto my google drive and re-edit a story a little bit so i'm not even done with my work day <laughs> there you go we'll let you go we'll let you go i appreciate that everyone thanks for thanks for this um it was a fun fun conversation of course jeff you're welcome back anytime and i'm sure we'll we'll your viewers will see you again very soon gentlemen until next time thanks so much huh take care everybody bye-bye thanks bye-bye bye, -bye. bye.